Yeah, is the sound comfortable for everyone? Is the light comfortable for everyone? And are you comfortable? Well, you shouldn't be. The planet's going to shit in a handbag. <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm, that's just my John Lilly imitation. It's not me at all. Uh, in order to make sure we all understand the domain we're operating from here, I would like to talk a little about what it's like to be loaded. In or because I think that's the ground zero of what we're talking about. It, psychedelics are like any other uh, social phenomena. There are a lot of wannabes. There are a lot of people who are along for the ride. I'm sure the pagan community is no stranger to this phenomenon because there are certain residual spin-offs if you proclaim yourself pagan that are hard to obtain any other way, similarly for being psychedelic. Uh, my notion of, of the psychedelic cosmogony, if you want to think of it that way, is it's like a bullseye. It's like a series of concentric circles and various substances place you in various quadrants of that mandala at various distances from ground zero, which is at the absolute center. And nature in her bounty has provided various coordination points. I mean, there's the cannabis coordination point, the opiate coordination point, uh, the tropanes that were so important in European witchcraft, the solanaceous plants, hyalcyamine, those things. That's a different chemical family and a different uh, uh, group of plant families that these compounds occur in. And in, you know, I've been at this fairly steadily since 1964 and have tried to do everything with a certain level of attention and uh, uh, reverence because I think that you know it's all very fine to go armed with the knowledge of pharmacology dose response LD50 and all that but I think as pagans and magicians we really understand that the mind can do anything and uh, there's a horribly frightening little passage in Jung somewhere where he says uh, the unconscious has a thousand ways to terminate a life that has become meaningless uh, meaning you know you'll step in front of a streetcar or something so in my lifetime of looking at these things and being interested in many other things as well, uh, heresies, uh, obscure backwaters of art history and literature, um, peculiar philosophies that rose and fell centuries ago in obscure parts of the world. My theory of life's exploration is to run edges. And I've mellowed over the years, but I used to say, if a book isn't a hundred years old, you shouldn't read it. If a person isn't dead, you shouldn't worry about them. If they wrote in English, you shouldn't bother with them, <clears throat> so forth and so on. In the course of sorting out the, as many peculiar and bizarre possibilities as life could offer me in many places, uh, my attitude was always critical. My attitude was always a show-me attitude. I don't believe in faith. I don't believe in belief. 
My favorite gospel story is the story of the Apostle Thomas, who was not present when Christ came the first time after the resurrection to the upper room. And then later Thomas came to the apostles and they said, uh, the master has been here. And he said, you guys have been smoking too much of that red lab. And then Christ came again. But in this conversation with the apostles, Thomas said, unless I put my hand into the wound, I will not believe it. And then time passed, and then Christ came again to the upper room. And he said, Thomas, come forward. Put your hand into the wound. And he did, and then he said, Lord, I am not worthy, so forth and so on. My conclusion about this story is that alone among all humanity in all times and places, only one person ever touched the incorporeal body of God. Thomas the doubter touched because he doubted. It was not necessary that the believers should be vouchsafed such a boon, but the doubter was awarded the supreme enlightenment. <clears throat> okay, so much for that. So my, my, my thing has always been, whether you present me with a diet, a, a social arrangement, a society, a sexual conundrum, a work of art, my, my criteria is, is it shit or is it Shinola? And uh, I'm happy to give you the benefit of my personal uh, life's experience proceeding along those lines. I want to talk about uh, what to my mind is the quintessential hallucinogen and consequently the quintessential spiritual and magical tool of this dimension and that is DMT, dimethyltryptamine, a compound that occurs in the human nervous system. It occurs in many, many plants. It is the commonest hallucinogen in all of nature. And I don't know how you got to where you are this afternoon, but the way I got here is uh, by testing and by hoping and by pursuing a magical, if that's the word, a miraculous, a transcendental ideal that over the course of life experience strips from you. You know, you have to get a job, your first love is not your last love. Slowly this pristine, shining belief in perfectibility is eroded by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. You know, the dark oxen that turn the millstones of the world. But I'm here to tell you that it is real. There is a doorway into another dimension. Aladdin's lamp is real. Fairyland is real real magic is real in the most real sense in the same sense that what we call reality is real and i learned this uh through this compound and one of the great puzzles about this compound is why more people don't know about it. No, no brotherhood initiated me. No lineage reaching back to the fall of Atlantis brought me into its circle. Uh, therefore, I feel completely free 
to say anything I want. Nobody has ever come to me and said, you are spilling the beans, you are telling the secret. Uh, a long, long time ago, and you know, we all have different opinions, this is mine, uh, I hope it doesn't offend, but a long, long time ago I took an oath to tell all secrets that came my way. Don't tell me a secret. I won't keep it. I'm against secrets. I'm against hierarchies, lineages, uh, all assumption of special knowledge on the part of anyone in the presence of anyone else is abhorrent to me. I mean, I am a true anarchist, first and foremost. So, uh, DMT, like all things in this world, has a physical body, a presence and a presentation. In this case, it looks rather like earwax. Uh, it is orange. It is crystalline. It smells vaguely of mothballs. And uh, for my money, it is the lapis, the quintessence, the universal panacea at the end of time has sent a reflection back through the temporal labyrinth and wherever this touches, wherever this concresses, the mystery is fully present. So what is it then? Well, it's an experience and I maintain it's the most intense experience you can have this side of the yawning grave without doubt. I mean, people say, is it dangerous? Well, the answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. Yes, that's a, that's a joke here. It's not a joke there, because you, you find yourself ho literally holding your heart to verify that you have not, in fact, had a coronary thrombosis induced by wonder, terror, reverence, and astonishment. So, here it is, the quintessence, the orange thing. The, it, was it transponded in from Arturus? Was it handed down through some ancient eldritch brotherhood that found this secret before the pyramids were built? Who can say? Whatever it is, wherever it comes from, here's what happens when you allow it to pass through uh, the blood-brain barrier of your own alchemical vessel, which is your body. The first thing that happens is that there is a sense as though all the air in the room had been sucked out. All the colors brighten. This is that increase in visual acuity that I made so much of yesterday. All edges become sharp. Distant things stand out in their clarity. This is at one toque. At two toques, you close your eyes, you feel a sense of anesthesia seeping through your body. You close your eyes and you see a floral pattern rotating in space, usually yellow-orange. People who do this occasionally, and nobody does it a lot, call it the chrysanthemum. It's a floral pattern, like a pattern in a Chinese brocade. This forms and stabilizes, and then you either break through it or you require one more toque. And these are matters of physiology, uh, shamanic intent, so forth and so on. The leather-lunged hash smokers among us have a leg up in this department. Th this is a spiritual discipline where the ability not to cough makes the difference between shunyata and, you know, try again, Sam. <clears throat> so, you take, let us assume, a third toke. 
long and slow through a glass pipe. Pure, you vaporize this stuff. You don't mix it with weed or oregano or any of that, which was done in the past. You want the pure stuff. And you take it in and in and in. And there is definitely somewhere in here a threshold a threshold which you must exceed and when you do that this membrane like thing this chrysanthemum will actually part and there is a sound uh, like the crumpling of a plastic bread wrapper or the crackling of flame a friend of mine says this is the radio intellecti of your soul exiting through the anterior fontanelle at the top of your head uh, could be in any case this crackling sound and a tone a tone a and then there's this impression of transition and you're now 20 seconds deep into this experience there's an impression of transition there, it's as though there were a series of tunnels or chambers that you are tumbling down, being propelled by some kind of muscle behind you that is pushing you. I mean, yes, birth canal, yes, yes, of course. But anyway, a tunnel, and what I've noticed about this tunnel is the walls and ceiling flux and come down to meet each other, and where they touch, they pull apart with a and then you're propelled into the next space and then the next and then the next and there is this right <laughs> and then you are there and this is what I want to talk to you about, because of all communities, uh, I, I hope, perhaps collectively, singly, someone can say something enlightening about this. Then you are there, and where is there? It's underground. How you know this, you cannot say, but there is an irreconcilable sense of enormous mass surrounding you. In other words, you are underground. You're at the center of a mountain or something. And you're in a room which aficionados call the dome. And people will ask each other, did you see the dome? Were you there? It's softly lit, indirectly lit. And the, uh, the walls, if such they be, are crawling with geometric hallucinations, uh, very brightly colored, very iridescent with deep sheens and very high reflective surfaces. Everything is machine-like and polished and throbbing with energy. But that is not what immediately arrests my attention. What arrests my attention is the fact that this space is inhabited that the immediate impression as you break into it is there is a cheer. The gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. You break in to this space and are immediately swarmed by squeaking, self-transforming elf machines. These things which are made of light and grammar and sound that come chirping and squealing and tumbling toward you and they say hooray welcome you're here and in my case you send so many you come so rarely <clears throat> and and my uh, my immediate impression, no matter how many times I do this, and I've done it maybe 30 or 40 times, which isn't a lot in a lifetime of worshipping it, my immediate impression is that they are welcoming. 
there is something going on which I over the years come to call love L-U-V not light utility vehicle but love that is not like eros or not like sexual attraction I don't know what it's like exactly it's almost like a physical thing it's like a glue that pours out into this space and my immediate impression in there is I'm appalled I'm appalled at how far I've come and one of the strange things about DMT is that it does not affect your mind in the ordinary sense in that you know drugs they make you giggly they frighten you they stimulate you they depress you DMT does none of this you go to that place with all your groceries you're there and you're there thinking Jesus H fucking Christ what is this what is it and there because and you're thinking you know I must be dead I've done it this time the the psychedelic mantra I've done it this time <laughs> I, I must be dead and so you you know you you think heart heart yes hmm heart mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pulse pulse yes yes and meanwhile these things are literally in your face and what they do is they jump into your chest and then they jump out again and what they're doing and this is the point I think what they're doing is they are singing chanting speaking in some kind of language that is very bizarre to hear but what is far more important is that you can see it they speak in a language which you see and this is completely confounding because syntax is not something you ordinarily reach out and touch and in this space that's what's happening and so like jeweled self dribbling basketballs these things come running forward and what they are doing with this visible language that they create is they're making gifts they're making gifts for you and they will say which condenses as something which looks like a cross between a sop with camel, a Havana cigar, a piece of abalone, an opal, and a nuki, and they offer it to you. And you're looking at this thing, and as you look at it, it also transforms, changes, speaks, sings, uh, undergoes metastasis, undergoes metamorphosis, and these things are just accumulating and each elf machine creature elbows others aside says look at this look at this take this choose me and as you direct your attention into these things you have the overwhelming conviction that if you could bring a single one of these objects back to this world that somehow you wouldn't have to say anything you would just walk up to people and say friend and people would say oh my god you know you got a piece of the action the real action <clears throat> so um, this state of ecstatic frenzy and it's it's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon running backwards in cyberspace or something this state of incredible frenzy goes on for about three minutes and all the time the elves are saying don't give way to wonder do not abandon yourself to amazement pay attention pay attention look at what we're doing look at what we're doing and then do it do it and it, it's this thing where then everything stops and they wait and you feel like a, a torch 
a spark lit in your belly that begins to move up your esophagus. And eventually when it reaches your mouth, your mouth just flies open. And this language-like stuff comes out. Acoustically, it's but what you're you're not hearing it the startled friends who sent you to this place are putting up with this what you're experiencing is a visual modality where these tones are surfaces, shading, colors, insets, jewels. You are making something. You know, erase, move forward, add cerulean, put in stippling. It's that sort of thing. And, um, and they go mad with joy when you do this and then uh, you know this goes on for about 30 seconds and then there is like a ripple through the system and you realize these two continua are being pulled apart and i had one trip where the the and often it's very erotic although i'm not sure that's the word but it's something it's almost like sex is the surface of something of which this is the volume. And I'm a great fan of sex. I don't mean to denigrate it. I mean to raise DMT to a very high status. Uh, but it, it's, it's astonishing. In one trip, as the pull-away maneuver began, all the elves turned simultaneously and looked at me and said, Deja vu. Deja vu. So, this is an experience which in some form, I mean it will be different for each one of you, but in some form at least what will be similar to my description is how dramatic it will be. It will hit you as hard as it hit me if you do it right. This, to me, this experience is of a fundamentally different order than any other experience this side of the yawning grave. And why religions have not been built around it, why empires have not risen and fallen around the control of its sources, why theology has not enshrined it as its central exhibit for the presence of the other in the human world, I don't know. I can tell the secret. As you notice, nothing shuts me up. Uh, but why this is not four-inch headlines on every newspaper on the planet, I cannot understand because I don't know what news you were waiting for, but this is the news that I was waiting for. Uh, It's an incredible challenge to, to human understanding to try and make sense of this. And I started out, you know, reading Jung, doing my Hindu, you know, getting up to speed with all that, studying Zen Buddhism, studying shamanism. The thing that puzzles me about DMT is how little trace there is of it in the human world. I can't point to a period in European art or the art of some group of islanders somewhere and say that is very much like DMT. It isn't. And yet the DMT thing is it's like an avalanche of orgasmic beauty, but a certain kind of beauty. The only words that I can find for the kind of beauty that it is is bizarre alien, outlandish, outre, 
streaky and at the very edge of what the human mind seems to be able to hold. Well, where is this coming from? And what is happening? And, and this is what I like to discuss with people such as yourselves who have wide experience in the world and in the realms of the unseen. This has to be taken seriously. In other words, the it's only a hallucination thing. That horseshit is just passe. I mean, reality is only a hallucination for crying out loud. Haven't you heard? So that takes care of that. It's only a hallucination. What we've got here, folks, is an intelligent entelechy of some sort that is frantic to communicate with human beings for some reason. And uh, the possibilities can be logically enumerated. I mean, what we've got here is either this is an extraterrestrial, you know, evolved in a, around a different star, possibly with a different biology, may not even be made of matter, came across an enormous distance sometime, maybe long ago, has some agenda which we may or may not be able to conceive of. This is it, the real thing. As the little girl said in Poltergeist, they're here. So that's one possibility. That's just one possibility. Uh, and I, I present these without judgment because I'm not sure. Uh, uh, if an extraterrestrial wanted to interact with a human society, and it had ethics that forbade it from landing trillion-ton beryllium ships on the United Nations Plaza. In other words, if it were subtle, I can see hiding yourself inside a shamanic intoxication. You would say, let's analyze these people. Okay, they're kind of hard-headed rationalists, except they have this phenomenon called getting loaded. And when they get loaded, they accept whatever happens to them. So let's hide inside the load and we'll talk to them from there and they'll never realize that we're of a different status than pink elephants. Okay, that's one possibility. Now, another possibility is that this is not about extraterrestrials flight and enormous technologies and distant homelands that, uh, and this is maybe closer to friendlier to pagan notions, that there is a parallel continuum nearby, essentially right here, and call it fairyland, call it the western realm, whatever you like, but you don't go there in starships you go there through magical doorways which are opened via ritual and, uh, and things like that. That is a possibility as well. Certainly human folklore in all times and places except Western Europe for the last 300 years has insisted that these parallel domains of intelligence and, and uh, uh, organization exist. There is a third possibility, which I leave it to you to decide whether this is the more conservative position or the more radical position. And I reached this reluctantly, and I'm not sure this is my position, but uh, these things have a weird, these tykes, as I call them, these self-transforming machine elves, these, these syntactical homunculi have a very weird relationship to human beings. First of all, they love us. They care for some reason. Wh whoever and whatever they are, they're far more aware of us than we are aware of them. I mean, witness the fact that they welcome me. Uh, so, is it possible that at the end of the 20th century, 
at the end of 500 years of materialism, reductionism, positivism, what we're about to discover is probably the least likely denouement any of us expected out of our dilemma. What we're about to discover is that death has no sting. That what you penetrate on DMT is an ecology of human souls in another dimension of some sort. I mean, this is hair-raising to me, and I spent my whole adolescence and early adulthood getting free from uh, Catholicism and its assumptions, and I never imagined that a thorough exploration of life's mysteries would lead to the conclusion that, in fact, uh, this is but a prelude. We are in a very tiny womb of some sort. Our lives are gestations, and this is not where we are destined to unfold ourselves into what it means to be human. This is some kind of a metamorphic stage, uh, like the pupa of a butterfly. And so, uh, th this is deep water. Because, you know, we are fairly agitated over the fact that we fear the planet is dying and us with it. This stuff raises the issue that you don't know what dying is. Therefore, it's very uncertain exactly what sort of an attitude we should take to it. And as I say, I am not advocating a position Mysteries are not unsolved problems. They are mysteries. When you stand naked in the presence of the mystery, it is still utterly and completely mysterious. But I enjoy talking to people about this because I think that the human body, the human mind, these are tools for the soul to use in the effort to unlock its meaning and its destiny. And uh, millions of people, perhaps billions of people, have gone to the grave without knowing that this is possible, this experience that I've just described to you. And it's perfectly harmless. I mean, I think that if science would uh, back out of politics and do its work, we could establish that DMT is the most harmless, the safest of all hallucinogens. The fact that it occurs naturally in the human brain is the first clue to its, the fact that it's benign. The second clue is the fact that uh, it only lasts eight to twelve minutes. What that means to a pharmacologist is the body perfectly understands what to do with this compound. You take a hit of DMT and your body says, oh I recognize this, uh, activate deanimation cycle, activate demethylation cycle, activate... It knows what to do. And so within ten minutes you're down. Uh, a, a drug that you take and 48 hours later you're lying around in warm baths and refusing telephone calls is a drug you shouldn't have taken uh, be, because it's hitting you too hard that's not it's not clean it's not smooth DMT the most powerful hallucinogen known to man and science clears your system in 15 minutes I mean you're so down, you can't, you don't have a small headache or need to take a nap or anything. You're ready to do phone calls. Um, so how can it be then that a compound which each of us carries right here, right in the pineal gland, right in the Ajna Chakra, the Philosopher's Stone is no further away than that. How can this be secret from us? 
How can we be trapped in a dimension of such limitation and such mundaneness when our own nervous systems and the ecology around us and our own history over the past half million years argues that this is what we were born and bred for. This is where we belong. This is what at play in the fields of the goddess must mean. And somehow history has uh, made us dysfunctional, buried the mystery, made it, a, a, if at best, a piece of secret knowledge jealously guarded by somebody. I mean, I don't know. There are lots of mystery cults and secret societies in the world. I don't know if any of them are guarding DMT as a secret. I, I, it may be so. No one told me to keep my mouth shut. Uh, if a, a very suggestive short story, I'm sure many of you know and love the, the Argentine surrealist writer Jorge Luis Borges. Well, Borges has a book, I believe it's called Labyrinths, and in Labyrinths there is a short story called The Sect of the Phoenix, and it says there is a sacrament older than mankind. The sectarians have been the victims of every persecution in human history, and the sectarians have been the purveyors of every persecution in history. These sectarians are not identifiable by race or place or language or time. To the adept, the mystery appears ridiculous, yet they do not speak of it. One child can initiate another. It is orange. Ruins are propitious places. Do it in the moonlight, in the thre at, at the thresholds of buildings. And that's all it said. It's a page and a half. And it suggests, and, and see, here's the thing. I, I mean, I am not as articulate on this subject as I wish I could be. If this is not the secret that these lineages are guarding, then they're guarding an empty house. This is the secret. It is. It is. It cannot be anything else. It is the Neoplatonic One. It is the transubstantiant object, the panis supersubstantialis of the alchemist. And, it's, and, and I'm not saying that people have known about this for a long time. Uh, DMT is in many plants, as I said but spread very thinly. And we don't have historical records of anyone ever concentrating it. I've done the DMT uh, plant preparations of the Amazon, the snuffs, and the ayahuasca. And on ayahuasca, if it is heavily laced with the DMT-containing plant, after hours of breath work and drumming alone in the jungle, you can begin to open it up to the place the DMT will carry you to in 45 seconds in an Upper East Side apartment, uh, whether you like it or not. Some of you may have seen, I don't, years and years ago, this B movie about a guy who has a big ranch in Mexico, and one of the campesinos comes rushing back from having encountered a brontosaur in the forest, and he can only point inarticulately at the woods and say, something, 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 something. <clears throat> And that's what I am. I'm a monkey. And I've come back to the truth. And I'm telling you, there's something over the next hill that is off the scale. Off the scale. And I have made it my business to, you know, delve. I'm a delver. I'm a noetic archaeologist. Uh, I, there, the, obscure heresies and strange rites and all of this stuff, been there, done that. It's all pale soup compared to this. 
And so I, I hype it to you simply to try and inspire you to explore it. We are at the present state in the position of explorers of the new world 50 years after Columbus. We have notebook entries. We have partial maps, but we don't have a complete map of what this thing is. It's another dimension. It is literally another dimension. I took uh, DMT to a, a llama of great accomplishment, not one of the grab-ass can of Budweiser welded to the good right hand llamas, but a real llama. This guy was over 90 when he smoked DMT, and uh, he sensed his wheel has turned. Uh, and he said to me, he said, it's the lesser lights. He said, you can't go further into the bardo and return. And so I think that we stand at the brink of an enormous frontier. Call it incorporeality, call it non-material existence, or, you know, bite the bullet. Call it death. But this is the frontier that we stand on the edge of. This is what history has been about. History has been some kind of suicide plot for 15,000 years. Not a moment passed that the plot was not advanced closer and closer and closer and closer to completion. And now in the 20th century, you know, we see that this thing this transcendental object at the end of time, this attractor has been that chose us out of the animal kingdom and sculpted the neocortex, opposed the thumb, stood us on our hind legs, gave us binocular vision. This thing is calling us toward itself across eons of cosmic time. We are asked to mirror it and as we mirror it, we become more of its essence. And as we become more of its essence, we leave behind the animal organization that we were uh, cast in in the beginning. And what this is about, who knows? You know, is this a drama of cosmic redemption? Is it uh, uh, the transcendental other at the end of time? Is it a Gnostic demon? Is it Ildabua? What is it? We do not know. But I really believe we are in the era when we will come to know. And what the psychedelics are, are periscopes in the temporal dimension. If you want to see a little bit into the future, elevate your psychedelic periscope outside of the three-dimensional continuum and peer around. For thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, we have been pulled toward this omega point. The earth is like an egg. It has come to its moment of fructification. The dawn that has been anticipated since we were herding our cattle across the plains of Africa is now upon us. The east is streaked with the blush of rosy dawn. It is coming upon us. And I think that it will redeem history. That history is not a nightmare. It is a passage. It is an initiation. Think of the fetus in the womb at the moment of transition. Surely it must despair. The walls are closing in. It's being crushed and strangled. Gone are the endless amniotic oceans of a few months before. The weightlessness, the effortless delivery of food through the umbilical cord. Suddenly, it's just boundaries and agony and crushing pressure. That's where we are. And we are going to have to shed history like a snake sheds its skin if we want to slip off into hyperspace where I think all of magical humanity is awaiting us and cheering us on, lending their weight. 
they're all out there, you know, Proclus and Plotinus and Plato and Hypatia and Henry Cornelius Agrippa and John Dee and Robert Flood and Eliaphas Levy. They're all out there pulling for us. And every shaman and shamaness, every magician, practitioner, as far back in time as you go, was part of the plan, the conjuration, the great work, the distillation of the quintessence. It, history is a magical invocation. And at the end of that invocation, if it is correctly done, all boundaries will dissolve into the stone the lapis, a trans-dimensional vehicle that can move through space and time, that is the collectivity of all human souls free at last in what William Blake called the divine imagination. And you don't have to wait for the general dispensation. You can join up anytime by hyperspatializing your metaphors and your point of view through psychedelic symbiosis with the plants that are pouring this hyperdimensional Gaian vision into the minds of anyone who will detoxify themselves from history and, uh, and linear thinking and but open themselves to the presence of the transformative mystery that is going to leave this planet unrecognizable to us within our lifetimes. So that's uh, the basic spiel. And and I think it raises a lot of questions and yours is first. The answer is yes, uh, yes. The question is, are there herbs in the temperate zone that contain DMT? And uh, yes, um, there are certain grasses, Phalaris arundinacea, Phalaris tuberosa. These can be ordered from plant dealers or gotten, ironically enough, from agricultural experiment stations because these are pasturage grasses. Uh, a lot of people are doing wonderful work right now learning how to make DMT preparations out of native plants. Uh, the, the mature Phalaris grass, it's very diffuse, the DMT. So what people are doing is they're getting the seeds and they're sprouting them in a sprouter and then they're taking the sprouted seeds and air drying them. Well, you can imagine how powdery sprouts become if you air dry them. Well, then you can powder up a handful of these sprouts and uh, roll that, twist that into a bomber and come very, very close to the flash point. The other thing, I mean, since I'm talking to recipe-oriented magicians, the other thing you need to understand if you want to work in this area is that the DMT can ordinarily not be taken orally because there is an enzyme system in your intestines called the monoamine oxidase system then it will destroy the DMT but the good news is there are certain compounds called monoamine oxidase inhibitors didn't you know it if you take a monoamine oxidase inhibitor and then you take DMT, the DMT will survive the gut and pass into the bloodstream and pass the blood-brain barrier. So here is a very important piece of practical information I'm about to give you. If you want to inhibit your monoamine oxidase in order to uh, make DMT trips longer or mushroom trips longer and more intense or to activate DMT if you only have a little bit of it then what you should get are the seeds of Pergamon Harmala P-E-R-G-A-M-U-M Pergamon Harmala H-A-R-M-A-L-A -A. 
you can either order it under that name from seed dealers or go to an Iranian market uh, and buy what is called Hermal, H-U-R-M-A-L. This is simply Pagamon harmless seeds. They use it as an incense uh, to fumigate rooms. But two grams, don't take more, two grams of this uh, macerated in a mortar and pestle with spring water taken from a spring at the new moon near a crossroads <laughs> will uh, uh, inhibit your MAO. It will inhibit your MAO. Consequently, then when you smoke the bomber of Phalaris dust, it will grab on. Or you can even smoke mushrooms then and they will grab on. Uh, so knowing how to inhibit MAO is one of the key techniques in this kind of herbal shamanic magic. Uh, other plants that contain DMT, and here's one you all should be aware of because it's probably right around here, is uh, Desmanthus illinoisensis, Illinois bundle weed. It's a, it's a rank weed. Of, I've not seen it except in the dried form, but people have grown hundreds of pounds of this stuff in a few months. And the root bark has the highest concentration of DMT ever measured in any plant. It's, it's higher than the ayahuasca admixtures used in the Amazon. Pardon? In the root bark, the root bark, which uh, you, sh you dry the root and then scrape the bark off and you'll get this reddish root bark. The red is actually the DMT. Varola trees in the Amazon shed DMT in their sap and it's always a blood red sap. And to show you how strong it is, uh, the Indians in the Amazon, some of the tribes, they roll their arrow points directly into that sap and it's a paralytic poison in the bloodstream of monkeys and small animals. Uh, so there is a great deal of work is being done right now and you should, if you're of an experimental and herbal and alchemical and magical bent, uh, people are creating what they call ayahuasca analogs. This is where you use local plants to create a brew which is chemically equivalent to an Amazonian hallucinogen. And of course, you have the satisfaction that it's yours. It's your magical recipe. No one on earth is doing quite what you've got. And uh, it's very, uh, a lot of interesting work is being done. And uh, you'll hear more about this. In fact, Jonathan Ott just wrote a book called Ayahuasca Analogues, in which the state of the art is spelled out and it, it would be worth your while to check that out if you're an experimentalist. Yeah. The, the question is, is there a more, is there a simple reagent test for the presence of DMT? The answer is sort of. You can do a paper chromatographic test, and all you need is a little, a little UV light and some chromatography paper and some solvent dishes. I mean, it's at the level of a seventh grade uh, science project. Uh, yes, I don't know how much I should say on this subject. I'm probably about to say too much. But at one gathering I go to, uh, one of the people who's a very regular part of that particular posse is a wheat breeder. So when he heard about the Phalaris, he was a geneticist and a wheat breeder, and he has been working very quietly on his own at, to produce super strains of Phalaris. And I think we will soon see super strains because the underground community is incredibly creative in this area. The, the compound I talked about yesterday, salvia divinorum, 
That's all underground work. Brett Blosser, the anthropologist who discovered it, is a complete freak. Uh, the guy, the chemist who extracted it, who would prefer I don't put out his name, is a complete freak. And the people who then did the confirmation studies, my brother and his band of performing pharmacologists, all freaks. So we actually, we do not take ourselves seriously enough. I mean, we have our scientists, we have our philosophers, we have our thinkers, our legal experts. We are a complete community. And it's no longer, in my mind, even necessary to publish in straight journals and to seek a pat on the head from, you know, the American pharmacology community. Uh, they don't understand what these things are for anyway. Yes. Yes, I'll repeat this um, and strengthen once again my case to the guy who owns the company that he should pay me, for God's sake. Um, if you want a catalog of extremely rare and useful psychoactive and magical plants, probably the most complete in the world, the company is called Of the Jungle, P.O. Box 1801, Sebastopol, S-E-B-A-S-T-O-P-O-L, California, 95472. Write and ask for a catalog and tell them George Bush sent you. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Don't tell them that. They won't send you the catalog. <laughs> Well, let me, I didn't mean to diss Castaneda as a metaphor maker. No, I think The Teachings of Don Juan is a tremendous book. Uh, I, I'm very suspicious of, of some of his later stuff. It's um, interesting what you said, because you know the famous crow transformation in The Teachings of Don Juan has been traced, and I'm sure many of you know this book, has been traced to George MacDonald's book, through the gates of the Silver Key. Uh, and, and George MacDonald <clears throat> was a friend of Evans Vance. So I think what we're getting here is a mining of late 19th century English folklore by Castaneda. Nevertheless, uh, the, the presence of these small entities has been a part of folklore for a long, long time. Uh, elementals, tykes, what puzzled me about, what puzzles me, I guess, is I've spent a lot of time in this magical literature and, and art historical area, and the descriptions don't quite match. I can't quite convince myself that the, the, the sprites, the afrites, the nixies, the jinns, that these creatures of the woodland fae are the same thing. Or, I don't know whether I am contaminated by an early love of science fiction and... Well, again, close, but no banana. Uh, there, all these popular aliens that are running around, you know, the Whitley Streboids and all these things, are, to my, are, are much more mundane than what I encountered. I mean, what I encountered was terrifyingly not human, terrifyingly alien, and I, I just do not quite get, and Madame Blavatsky was into it, and they're always saying, you know, they, I don't know, they're very sort of cut and dried about it, and when I encounter an extraterrestrial alien or a creature from another dimension, the main thing that's happening for me is the implications are blowing my mind. They don't, they seem totally immune to the implication. Yeah. Well, a sufficient amount of DMT is smoked uh, uh, west of the Pacific Coast Highway that it wouldn't surprise me uh, if the writers of Star Trek, I mean, uh, were on to this. Um, 
Yes, what, um, what, I, what is not much talked about, the part of the experience which is anomalous, and maybe people who know more about magical literature than I do can correct me, but this, what the elves are really interested in is this stuff which I call visible language. That's the whole point of the encounter, is to exhibit it and to get you to do it. Well, now, first of all, think for a minute about ordinary language. It's really weird. It's the weirdest thing we do. I mean, if you were looking for the thumbprint of God on creation, human language would be a good candidate. Because, look, we're supposed to be some kind of animal who just went a little further than the next guy. but. To get out of that Shakespeare and Milton is a pretty amazing accomplishment, hardly to speak of the mathematical languages that we generate. So something happened. Some people think only 35,000 years ago. Imagine if that's true. I mean, I don't care. Some people say 150,000 years ago. But to speak, to take small mouth noises, and to turn them into signifiers for symbols and relationships, uh, in spite of some people's en enthusiasm for cetaceans and dolphins, I just am not overwhelmed by the evidence. I mean, n it, to me, you know, it is a miracle to be able to speak poetry. It is a miracle. I mean, when Coleridge wrote and south and south and southward I we fled and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high went floating by as green as emerald I mean that's language and uh, it's magic and we have a fascination then we also paint then we sculpt then we write then we create electronic databases, then film, television. Clearly, what we want to do is we want to communicate visually. And these things are saying there's a way to do it. Do it! And I don't understand. Do we all have to be loaded on DMT all the time? Can you learn to do this? The gentleman who asked about dreams, here's a piece of information that is critical in this jigsaw puzzle. If you have smoked DMT at any time in the past, it is possible to have a dream in which people are running around and you're checked into the Mars Hotel and the luggage is lost and this and that. And in the middle of all that, someone drags out a little glass pipe and hands it to you. It will happen. It will happen in the dream, not a memory, not a simulacrum. It will really happen. Well, now, to me, that's an amazing piece of data because what it's saying is you can do it on the Natch. You may have to be dead asleep, but still, on the Natch, this can be done. And the lucid dreamers, the biofeedback people, the people who claim these wonderful things that you can do with sleep and dream and programming, I challenge them, teach people to have DMT dreams in their sleep. And then let's figure out how to drag that puppy into the light so that we can do it at will on the Natch. Uh, one, just one second. And one thing that I have come to believe is that we remember no more than 5% of our dreams, and it's the most mundane 5%. I think, uh, and there's scientific evidence to support this, remember I said DMT is in the human brain? Well, it concentrates in the human cerebrospinal fluid on a 24-hour cycle, and it reaches its peak of concentration between 3 and 4 a.m. in most people. That's when the deep REM sleep is happening. When you give somebody DMT, they, they lay back, they close their eyes, and the way you, the guide, the sitter, I don't like the word guide, you, the sitter, the way you can tell that they're getting off 
is their eyes dart wildly behind their closed eyelids. It means they're in REM. They're in REM sleep. They've been immediately shoved into deep dreaming. So I believe that the, what DMT is doing in normal human metabolism is it mediates the descent, the spiral descent into dream, and that every single night we are reunited with the boundaryless oceanic mystery of being that we are so frantic about in waking life and so distant from. And that if we could, in fact, just engineer a drug that would allow us to remain fully conscious as we drift deeper into dream, we would need no other drug or substance. That that's where we want to go. And I think that's where history is headed. What the archaic revival is about is a revivification of the aboriginal dream time. We are going to live in the imagination. We are preparing to decamp from three-dimensional space. I mean, yes, the earth is the cradle of the human race, but you don't stay in the cradle forever, you know. And, uh, and it's something like going into dream. It's something like taking the hyper-technical virtual reality internet head of the snake and inserting the shamanic, late paleolithic, ecstatic, orgiastic tail of the snake, and then you have the Ouroboric completion. Then you have uh, the quintessence, and the work is complete, and history ends, and we live then in the light of the stone made manifest. Well, it, it definitely has something, this mystery that we're talking about, it definitely has something to do with sound and the magical role of sound. Uh, ayahuasca is a sort of different way of sectioning the DMT experience because ayahuasca is orally active, unfolds over hours, uh, is not as dramatic as DMT, but the people who use ayahuasca as a ritual on a weekly basis, what their uh, practice consists of is they take this stuff and then they sing. They sing like crazy. And then when they stop singing and people light a cigarette and take a leak and so forth, and you're listening to these conversations, you hear people say stuff about the shaman like, I like the part with the olive drab and the silver, but when it became magenta and moved toward orange, I thought he was over the top. You think, you know, what, what kind of a criticism of a song is that? And the answer is, sound has become a visually beheld medium. Yes, so what, the reason I have, the reason I'm interested in something as techno nerdy as virtual reality is because you could come, you could program a virtual reality so that when you went, ah, an iridescent blue line would be keyed to that to descend into the space. And I, I'm very interested in environmental and electronic simulations of psychedelic states. But, but we're not going to do better than the psychedelics. If we can do as well, it will be a miracle. I mean, you see more beauty in a first wave of psilocybin than the human race has produced in the past 5,000 years. And who are you, you know? <laughs> yes. No, I promised this guy, then you. And I felt his flash of loathing. <laughs> that's, I hadn't considered that, but that sounds possible. I mean, we're definitely coming to some enormous cusp 
and whether you think it's the cusp of cusps or just a big cusp, it's hard to say. Somebody faxed me. I got a fax right before I came here. I don't know who sent it to me. It was just an anonymous fax, but in huge letters it said, when you strip away the hype, it's just another concrescence. <laughs> yes. It's, it's interesting, and that's a good question. The answer is yes and no. Uh, obviously, a, there is hardly anything more personal than a psychedelic experience. It is a kind of summation of who you are, and it's viewed through the filters of your personality. Nevertheless, when you put a whole bunch of DMT trips together, certain things seem to emerge. My notion, coming at it from a sort of Jungian attitude, is if we had to say what is the archetype of DMT, the archetype is the circus. It's the circus. And let me say why. First of all, a circus is a place of wild, exotic activity. And it clowns. Are, you don't have a circus without clowns. And uh, clowns are wonderful for children. A circus is a wonderful place for a child. DMT, there is something very, very weirdly childlike about it in a very unchildish way. Uh, some of you may know the, thir the 50 second fragment of Heraclitus where he says, the aeon is a child at play with colored balls. The aeon is the child that you encounter in the elf dome. Uh, uh, so, uh, but the circus has other connotations than simply the three rings and the clowns. Uh, Eros is present entwined with Thanatos in the form of the nearly naked lady in the tiny spangled costume who is working without nets hanging by her teeth up near the top of the big tent. And personally, my, as my earliest experience of Eros was that lady in the tiny spangled costume. I was so small, I was wrapped up in something and being held, and I was horny as hell. Uh, uh, so there's that, and then there is also, radiating off from the central ring, the freak show, the goat-faced boy, the lady in the bottle, and, uh, you know, the three-toed alligator kid, and all of that, that's there, the wiggy, weird, kinky, strange, alien stuff. And then... Uh, if you think about the archetype, not so much of the circus, but of the carnival, the carnival represents a breakthrough from another dimension. Because you live in some uh, jerkwater town, in some, I almost said Iowa, but some, you know, and it's like normal. And then the carnival comes to town and children are told you can't stay out and play the carny people are in town and what does it mean well they may fuck differently than we do they may steal things they're not like us they've had more than one marriage some of them uh, and then the carnival people are there and the hoochie coochie dancers and the whole thing and then they fold it up and they go away just like a DMT trip. And every little boy and girl in the world worth their salt wants to join the circus, of course, and go away with the tattooed lady and the tigers and all that. So it is the archetype of the circus. So then I, I've seen many, many people take DMT and some get what I get, which is it's sort of gone beyond the circus. It's the circus, but uh, the circus as presented on the Nebelganubi Prime or something like that. Uh, 
But one woman who was an anthropologist who I think got a sub-threshold dose, she had a very interesting trip because it was a light trip, but with no prompting from me. She said, I was at a carnival midway, but uh, it was after hours, and there was nobody there, and there were just those ice cream, those square papers for holding ice cream were just blowing in the wind and getting caught in chain link fences. It was like a sub-threshold dose. Well, then if she'd done more, she would have arrived there eight hours earlier when the thing was happening. And if she'd done yet another toke, it would have moved off into the zone of the truly weird. That's why I love the film of Federico Fellini, because here was a circus man, for sure. Yeah. It, a way to get the DMT. Well, you you could conceivably inhibit your MAO. I don't want to tell you to do it nasally because it might be a really stinging experience. Well, then you could do it. Well, I, I'm working on something. I'll describe it to you. Uh, uh, I'm having a glass blower make a thing which has a chamber with a pipe stem coming off it, but it has a, another stem 180 degrees around the chamber coming off it that breaks into two prongs. And what you do is you heat the DMT, you insert the two prongs up your nose, and you have a friend blow on the other outlet and it will force the entire contents of the vessel, the entire load of white smoke. But, you know, don't try this at home, folks. Uh, <clears throat> Pardon me? I'd go light the first time. Uh, that's, you know, there are old pharmacologists and bold pharmacologists, but there are no old bold pharmacologists. Yes. There are antidepressants that are MAO inhibitors, that's right, but I wouldn't use them for this purpose because what you want is what's called a, a reversible MAO inhibitor. And harmine, which, which, uh, or harmaline, which is in the Syrian rue, is an, a reversible MAO inhibitor, reversible in four to six hours. Some of these antidepressants inhibit every molecule of MAO in your body for up to three weeks. And, and that's why when they give you those antidepressants, they tell you the long list of don'ts, you know, no chocolate, no red wine, no soft cheese, no lentils, no this. That's a list of alkaloid-containing foods. And if you are on those monoamine oxidase-inhibiting antidepressants and you eat eat a bunch of camembert with your yuppie friends, you'll probably have to be roped down for a while before you straighten out. Uh, just to sum this up and put a kind of a classifier on it, I am not very, I, I am not very interested in drugs per se. I've done a lot of them, bad ones, good ones, and people do drugs for fun and for stupid reasons and didn't. But there is this tiny chemical family, the tryptamine hallucinogens, psilocybin and DMT, and then some artificial cogeners, and 5-methoxy is in there too, which I'm not that fond of. Uh, but this is the doorway. It's the umbilicus of this world. These are things which are called drugs because that's the category we have for things which make the world unrecognizable. But these are not drugs. They are magical doorways into staggeringly titanic dimensions of gnosis, power, information, understanding, and dimensions filled with affection for humanity. So, uh, I, I, people say, well, you advocate, you think drugs should be legalized. Yeah, but that's the political opinion of Terence McKenna, who's just a guy like you. But this stuff about the, the tryptamines is a real discovery. 
and you can think what you like about me and my take on it. In fact, please do. But check it out. Check it out. Because I've, I've checked out lots of stuff, and this is the only thing I'm interested in telling you. Check it out. No, I don't understand that. the answer to that question. It is, it's magical. It is a, a secret which keeps itself. I mean, I, how, I, here I am. There are 200 people here, whatever, and I do this all the time. And I have not, so far as I can tell, been able to launch an avalanche of DMT. I'm trying. Do I have to put it any more plainly? Is there a chemist in the house who will go home and make this stuff so that we can find our way there, or grow the plants, or go to South America, or get with lucid dreaming and behavioral modification, or explore the outer edges of orgasm, which I think has something to do with DMT and probably runs on it. Somehow we need to beach this whale. Yeah. It's not difficult to make. Compared to cocaine or LSD, it's, it's a walkover. It is a reasonable exam question for a second-year student of organic chemistry to be told, synthesize and chromatograph five grams of DMT and submit your sample with your chromatographic data to my office Monday morning. <laughs> <coughs>